Welcome to Huddle Up with Matias Bueno. Today, our super special guest is a creative, a student athlete, a man from Calgary, Alberta. Brent, Stephen, welcome to the show, man. You are a track star. You're a runner, you're a track <laughs> star. You are a videographer. You do all sorts of things behind the scenes for the dinos. Welcome. It's super awesome to have you on, man. I yeah, appreciate you getting me on the show. I'm, ex- I'm excited. Haven't done much as a uh... Uh, with my title as a UFC ex- content producer, uh, my hiring letter still says I'm the videographer, although it was misspelled. So video traffer, but uh, you know, at this point, my role has expanded and changed. So content creator at the UFC. Being a creative is such a fascinating endeavor. It's the new, uh, to me, it's like the new world version of, of how to find wealth, so to speak. Like uh you think about old money, new money, when you're talking about wealth and you talk about people that let's say were in the steel industry, railroads, and then the new money was people that were in industries that are still taking off. And that's what I think of when people talk about being on YouTube as a, as a content creator, or when it comes to creating stuff on TikTok, or even just creating videos without yourself being in it. What fascinates you about being a creator and when was the origin of your desire to go down this path? Oh, where do I even start with this one? I mean, uh, I always liked sports media in general, you know, I've been going to Stamps King for the longest time and I liked what I saw on stage. And uh, at one point, I think it was about 14 or so. I was like, Oh, you know what? I really want to do like lighting for, for DJ shows or uh, not DJ shows, but like concerts and that sort of stuff. And that was just sort of in my head. Um, but I mean, I liked what they, I saw on, um, you know, on various channels from different teams. And I thought like, Hey, you know, I can do some of that stuff. So, uh, it really started with, uh, with, you know, photography. I picked up my friend's Canon T3i. This was in 2011 and I liked using it. I'm like, you know what? I want to buy a camera. So, uh, you know, just over time I learned how to use it. And then, uh, I ended up getting to video more. So, um, you know, the further I've gotten into the video, the more I've kind of realized this is my space. Cause I like telling stories. I like making exciting content i like doing uh that sort of stuff but i am not very good at writing I'm not very good at painting or drawing so uh i guess we can say this is my uh this is my art in a way you can say um so, you know something i can make that can you know evoke emotions or tell a story or you know just get people excited the dinos were the 2019 vanier cup champions in football something that had not happened in 24 years from that time and you were there on the scene being able to tell a lot of the story and even we we i guess did a bit of indirect collaboration when i was creating uh the video project for my internship with ufc and using some of the footage that you had taken it really aided me in being able to tell a compelling story because of the the types of shots the slow-mo everything what was super exciting about that whole experience because as a person who's shooting video people would think well you want to see them win the game or you want to see an exciting game in general but you're looking at it from a different lens no pun intended what was that experience like being able to be at the vanya cup shooting videos and creating content for the football team i mean just start from the beginning with that i it was just exciting that you know i got an email in my inbox from uh or it's text from uh ben match the assistant athletic director at the time now the uh, full-time athletic director at the ufc and he just said uh hey we might get you at the vanier what do you prefer a nighttime flight or a day flight no guarantees and i'm like well he said no guarantees i don't think this might happen and then uh, next thing i know there's you know, my name with a flight out uh, all the way out there next to David Mull, who's our photographer, very well known uh, in the industry. And there was me just kind of getting started doing videography. So I was like, oh, oh, I'm just like David now. That's great. So I was already excited that uh, they thought so highly of me and, you know, spent the money to send me all that way. Um, you know, the UFC hadn't had a really, hadn't really had a videographer um, and they would spend the money to send David around, but that's one guy. Now they're you know, doubling their spending in, uh, in some aspects. So, uh, you know, it was exciting to get that opportunity in my career, uh, just being so early on, um, actually getting there was a, uh, that was a whole ordeal. Uh, it was a red eye flight. I'm that was a terrible decision. I just should have just told them I'd fly out in the day and missed class or something. Um, uh, trying to think of what I can and can't say here. Um, but anyways, getting there was, uh, so I got there after, you know, basically being up all night, crying babies on the plane, that sort of stuff. 
Um, and I actually roomed with Andrew Buckley, which was interesting. So there's just all this excitement where, you know, I knew Andrew Buckley and I talked to him at games and stuff. Um, you know, I'm familiar with the Sam Peters. I think some people, not a lot of people actually know, but my dad is Mark Steven. He's been doing the play-by-play broadcast with Stan Peters for, uh, since 1996. Uh, he's in the CFL Hall of Fame. So I'm familiar with a lot of guys in the Stan Peters, including, you know, Buckley, a lot of these guys I knew a little bit, but there's still that excitement. It's like, oh, Dr. Coach Andrew Buckley. I get to, I get to room with this guy. Um, but when I was there, you could really see excitement building in all the players that, you know, they had, a lot of them had been there uh, many previous times and had failed. I think it was a couple of years leading up. Was it 16 and 17 they went, but lost? 16 and correct. then 17, they lost the uh, Mitchell Bolt to Laval. Right. And then, and then 18 was also the Mitchell Bowl, I think. It was back-to-back Mitchell Bowls, but they lost like in the national yeah. final in venue. It was 2016, yeah. Yeah, I'm the most up to date with uh, with the the post Brent Stephen era, which is now, or sorry, uh, yeah, post, not post. I'm still here. The Brent Stephen era, I'll just call it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, you know, just fast forward to to the actual game. Well, you know, let's say let's go towards the fourth quarter. Or so, um, you know, it was crazy just seeing all the guys getting so excited that you know each each and each play in the last two minutes, you know, they're getting excited because it's looking like we'll win. But you know, I, I was. Uh, I was cautiously optimistic because I'm like, no, this, this is all too good to be true at the moment. I've been flown out. We might win. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be a great flight back. Um, but Hey, it panned out. It worked out. Um, but in my head, you know, I'm looking at the score, how many minutes are left the plays. And I'm always thinking like, I think they can come back. If they do this, this, that, and the other get an onside kick. Oh, they, they could tie it. Uh, but then I think it was Hunter Carl came in, scored that touchdown, put them up to uh, 27 points. At that point, I'm like, oh, it's really going to happen here. We're going to we're going to win. This is an ideal trip. Um, being on the field afterwards, I, I ran out with the players when the uh, when they started shooting off the fireworks. And that was exciting. You could see guys were just losing it. Um, Subomi Oyasoro was crying even. And uh, I had a video clip of that that I've used in a couple of different spots. And, you know, it just really showed how much this meant to those guys. And being a student athlete myself, you know, that got me excited. I'm like, oh, I want to run my races. I want to do track stuff now. You know, it was just great seeing that team environment. And even though I'm in, uh, you know, an individual sport, just seeing the team aspect is great. And a lot of that stuff I, I even took forward to, uh, to the track team. Um, but no, it was, it was crazy seeing how excited, how happy those guys were. And, you know, that, that clip of Sabomi Oyasoro is, it might be one of my favorites I've, I've shot with the dinos because, you know, he's this, you know, huge, big, tough guy, you know, he's 220 something, a linebacker and, you know, he has his helmet in his hand. He's walking, just crying with how happy he is. So, man, it was, it was an experience. And there's a lot of footage that I shot in the locker room that can never see the light of day. Uh, <laughs> I, that's all I'll say about that. So I don't get in any trouble, um, but they, they were a happy group of guys. Watching the footage, even just from my perspective, uh, being on a computer screen was just amazing, let alone being there to feel the rush on the field after the game, listening to the sounds. Like, I honestly just felt so fired up while I was going through the footage, making it. I didn't even put in 80% of what you shot. And just watching it there, it almost made me feel like I was going to start crying. And I was like, man, like, it's just, it's so amazing to see how much it means to them what it's meant, especially after all the years. And I remember when I asked coach Harris, I was like, what, what does it mean after all these years? And when he started describing it and saying, you know, I thought about the time that had passed and his father wasn't able to be there. And he thought about his family and to see them win it and see like him cracking a smile, you know, he's usually pretty even keel, but seeing him crack that smile just made me grin like a little kid on Christmas, because you know how much, range of emotions there are felt inside of a coach who's been around a long time like he has especially he's been around football for a super long time but then when you see them finally break out of that mold and show excitement it's like you know what there's probably a lot of internal thinking like you said i i I like you bring that up you're talking about well this isn't gonna happen there's some way (laughs) like this is too good to be true and i feel like coaches always have a bit of that internally programmed because maybe a younger version of themselves got super excited when they were winning or they thought they were going to win and they didn't and they felt crushed. I'm sure even the coaches that tried to feel pretty serious and even killed in 2016 being up, whatever, 17, 10 or 17, seven, and then still losing 
it just felt gutted. So when you get to the Vanya Cup against Montreal, a team you've never played, well, that's crazier than betting on college football. Your heart rate is yeah. going to be a trillion uh, miles an hour, and you have no clue what's going to happen, right? I mean, obviously, you've put in the work to control the outcome as much as you can, but you still only can control what you can control. So then as a videographer, you're there not able to control anything. You're just watching and sitting there and praying, well, I hope we win because if we lose, it would suck to go back home. <laughs> be all devastated. But then being able to see them win, being able to see some of the, the lost files and the in the chamber of secrets that shall never see the light of day <laughs> is also a truly remarkable experience, I'm sure, that you'll never forget for the rest of your life. Oh, for sure. Yeah, something I'll take with me for a while. Uh, but back to that whole like, oh, the you know Montreal might be able to come back. I remember even in the last couple of minutes when it was really looking like we're going to win this. I think it was uh, Coach Rapini was just yelling at guys to, like settle down and get back on the bench because uh, I guess he had been through that before. Um, but I think, you know, just me being there, uh, a lot of the guys were excited. But, you know, I don't think I fully appreciated how how big it was for the team to win that, you know, not knowing the full history. I knew the last time that we had won was like 1996. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't know the full history of the team, uh, you know, losing a couple of times in years prior or just falling short. Um, Cause you know, my, I, my football life, I guess, has always been set around the Calgary Stampeders. I haven't known too much about U sports until, you know, I started working at the UFC and now I work with every team, you know, primarily football. Cause you know, whether other teams like it or not, they are a fairly big deal. Um, you know, they bring in a lot of funding. They're incredibly successful. There are a lot of athletes on the team that end up going pro. So, uh, you know, they do get a bit more media attention than a lot of other teams. And, you know, I've accepted that. My sport is one of those ones that maybe doesn't get quite as much coverage. Um, but we also don't really do anything on campus. So there's that as well. <laughs> yeah. And especially because you mentioned, like, if the football team carries the rest of the sports in terms of funding and the media attention they attract, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like, why are you going to be like, no, some other team has to go and they have to, to get all the attention. Like this team that literally pumps people into the pros, like a gold mine is not allowed to get more attention because whatever arbitrary reason, like it's, it's obviously worked. I mean, I remember the first conversation I had with Ben when we were doing orientation for my internship, he was talking about how, uh, Jack, the old uh, sports information director, he had been with the team for years and years and years, and he never legend. seen them win. Never seen them get to the even the the Hardy Cup. It barely happens. The second he officially leaves his role, boom, Dinos in the Vanier Cup. Boom, they're going to the, win in the Canada West two out of three years. They're winning four years in a row. All this stuff. So you talk about the Dinos experiencing a lot of successful football. That isn't even actually till a little more recently. Now, mind you, 2007 is already almost 15 years ago, which just makes us millennials seem like the time has gone just out the window in two seconds. But it's not like the dinos have been unstoppable for 40 or 50 years or anything. The Canada West is such a wide open division. You look at it this year, uh, Josiah was putting forth, you know, put together a Heck Crichton trophy nominee uh, performance in the first game. And then Regina wins the next week against Calgary and everyone's like, well, what happened? Even though the Phil Potts are still tied for heck Crichton nominees, you know, almost pretty neck and neck. They're putting up those Madden rookie video game numbers, but Bison's barely beat Regina and then beat Alberta handily on the road. Like anything can kind of happen. I think that's what makes Canada West interesting. So I think you're in a really good position to be able to tell a lot of stories that people wouldn't really know the full depth to because they just see what's on the surface. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would largely agree. I mean, it's exciting, but at the same time, it's not, you know, you never know what the outcome of the game is going to be. So as a spectator, it's probably interesting uh, to watch where, you're, you know, there's, there's that sense of, oh, I'm, I'm unsure. You know, that's something that draws in spectators, uh, that sense of, uh, or lack of security, I guess, in, in your team winning all the time. Um, I'd prefer if we do, that's always fun. Uh, <laughs> but the interesting thing is I can't say that I have worked at a Dinos game where, or at least a Dinos football game where we haven't won. So uh, I've definitely gotten to see the best side of uh, the entire football team. So I guess they're going to have to just start taking you on the road to every game to ensure they never lose again, right? A lot of the guys keep asking me if I'll go on uh, on road games with them. And I would absolutely love to, but one of the difficulties of being a creative in U sports is that we just don't have the same budgets that these big D1 schools have. And uh, a lot of the guys on the football team and basketball team, you know, they see the great media that they see pumped out of schools down in the States. But, you know, you come up here, 
you know, I, I'm not a full-time employee. Um, you know, if I am to become a full-time employee, I would definitely have to take on a lot of other roles. And, and it's just because, again, we just don't have the same budgets that they do down in the States. You know, I think in an article I was reading for an assignment, and this is outdated, so it might be a bit higher, but the funding for the athletics department for, I'm just trying to think, we have a, we have like 15, 17 varsity teams or something like that. So we have about $3.4 million that gets divided between all those teams. Whereas you look down in the States and a single team might have that same funding. Like even track programs in the States have, you know, $2 million to their name. Um, it's again, we just, we just don't exactly see that up here, even though we are a powerhouse, we have a lot of good funding, especially from like the fifth quarter association, you know, can we justify sending me out with the team everywhere? You know, again, I think they sent David around, uh, to a few games here and there, but for the most part, you know, we, uh, we rely on photographers in other markets. We'll see how that changes. Um, you know, there aren't too many videographers actually in the U sports space. If you look at the media of a lot of other teams, not to dump on them or anything, but you know, a lot of the time either just, it's non-existent or they're just using like Canada West TV highlights, which is kind of what the UFC was doing uh, before I came. Um, so Lance Doucette, who I guess his role, his, the, the title of his, his title keeps changing, but essentially he's my boss. Um, so he was in charge of doing a lot of the digital media stuff and he would use a lot of the highlights. And then I came in and then, you know, uh, year after year, I guess we just sort of leveled it up to the point where, uh, you know, a lot of what we're putting out is just exclusively my footage, or sometimes it'll be a mix of my footage and broadcast footage. Uh, like the intro video for the um, uh, Dinos football, that one I think has like one or two clips from broadcast. And uh, again, it's just because, you know, I, I didn't capture quite everything two years ago as the start of my uh, journey into creative media. So I'm hoping that, you know, we can update it and use less and less of that. Yeah, I think those clips are always way better. But when you have these visions in your head of the different angles that you see on television or that you even see from creatives down in the U.S., as you mentioned, having just way more inflated budgets, it can be tough to capture all those angles with the limited budget you have because you don't have 20 people with cameras at the game. There's just you. And you're unfortunately, you don't have like, you're not a... Uh, you're not an, uh, an octopus. You don't have like eight arms to like, you know, that can stretch hundreds of feet to different angles and zoom and this and that and the other. You kind of get what you can and then put that together. And But it still is obviously amazing work because Thanks. clearly, as you mentioned, the Canada West is a little bit and across U sports is limited with the number of full-time creatives they can have with the budget, with people maybe not having the, the means to be able to do it full-time without being paid for all the hours they work. Cause it is definitely very involved. People will see, Oh, a few videos on TikTok or whatever and say, wow, that looks really easy. But then when you go behind the scenes and even just putting together some of those videos or scroll, like going through the footage, you could spend a full-time job just looking through the footage. I'm sure. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. It's a, uh, it takes me a while to go through a lot of this footage that I have now. Um, you know, if, if there weren't, you know, if I wasn't there, you know, I kind of wonder what the UC would have done with a lot of that Vanier footage, you know, it would have been a lot of highlights because I, I, I didn't, I haven't, I haven't watched the full broadcast because I was kind of there um, but for the Vanier. Would they have captured some of those moments? You know, would we have seen Sabomi crying because he was so happy? Would we have seen the coaches, you know, lifting the trophy and everything? Um, Cause a lot of that, I, I don't know if they broadcasted too much of it. I have a few clips from the broadcast. Um, but I, I don't know exactly what they showed, but I can confidently say that it just probably wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have conveyed the emotion as, as much as my footage would have. And that's because, you know, I'm down there on the sidelines. I have a nice camera right in everyone's face. I can go to the locker room. Uh, you know, I'm not as, as constrained as, you know, traditional broadcast would be. Um, I think I'm important. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I would wait, I wish that a lot of other schools, uh, would have this, you know, I'd love to see you sports and Canada West just sort of elevate the media game. Um, but yeah, a lot of it, you know, again, just comes back, back down to budget for uh, for a lot of schools. Um, and one thing you were th I, I thought of while you were talking is that actually at uh, so the Southern, Al Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, SAIT, for those that aren't familiar, uh, they do have an athletics department. They compete in ACAC, which is the Alberta College Athletic Alberta Conference. Alberta that's Alberta it. That's Collegi it. Collegiate um, Athletic Conference. Yeah. That's yeah. Subdivision of CCAA. Uh, but there, I talked with our athletic director about potentially doing some work for them. And I found out that right now he's the only employee for the athletics department. When the pandemic hit, uh, everyone just got laid off uh, and unfortunately with budget cuts, they just haven't been able to bring everyone back. So, you know, he's, he's stretched pretty thin and they don't have uh, too many people out there doing media stuff, unfortunately, either. 
the same problem falls to other schools here in the MCAC. Uh, Manitoba finally became, or side note, finally became, I think, a member of or the CCAA to go to national tournaments, whereas before they couldn't. And even looking at their athletics department, it's like two guys, I think that's it. Like, and one of them is even like, I think he's almost full time, like maybe the 30 hour range, just not quite there. So it's difficult just with Canadian sports in general. Now, mind you, if you go down and move to move to Pennsylvania and go work for Penn state, then, you know, they'll probably give you the amount of money to be a full-time creative that some athletics directors would get in Canada. So, I mean, maybe that's the move. I don't know. Have you ever thought about where specifically you want to take your career in the next, let's say ballpark five ish years, or is it still just being immersed in the moment and just letting the creative flow take you wherever you want to go? I mean, there are a lot of opportunities. I've looked around at uh, certain jobs in the States and, you know, at some schools, the, the pay is not great for what we're doing at some schools. It's like, Oh, that's pretty okay. Um, I mean, I, in my ideal world, I'd absolutely love to be working for CSEC, uh, doing a lot of stuff with the Stampeders, uh, by extension, I do stuff with the Flames, Roughnecks, Hitman, all that. Um, so, I mean, in my ideal world, you know, I'd still be living in Calgary. I can do the Stampeders. I can do, you know, all the Dinos team stuff as well. Um, you know, CSEC, from what I've heard, uh, it's not always easy to get a job with them, but hey, we can hope for the best. It seems like my content now is, uh, is really making waves. Um, I was actually going to do some work for the CFL, but, you know, it circled back around to budget. Always fun. Um, so, hey, that would be my ideal world, but I'm always open to new opportunities. Um, working the States can be a little bit tricky with, uh, uh, with getting a green card and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I, I'd say I'd, I'd be lying if I said I hadn't looked around at, uh, you know, other markets. Um, you know, I know a couple of people working with MLSE that, uh, that really seem to like my stuff. A couple of people with the, uh, the Ottawa Red Blacks. Um, say so, hey, we'll see where it takes us. You know, uh, I, I guess some of the benefit of, uh, ownership structures in Canada is that, you know, there's MLSE, there's CSEC, um, OSEGs, these big, con- I guess, conglomerates, you could almost call them that own several different sports teams. So, uh, you know, there's some really good opportunities and, you know, because they're so big, they have bigger budgets and they can hire more people that are, you know, they're doing their job, they're making creative media, but they can, uh, do it across different properties. So I guess that sort of, uh, helps, helps economize it for, um, for those teams. Cause you know, let's say the stamps and everyone were separate. If the, you know, if the stamps were owned by a different group and the flames and the hitmen were owned differently, uh, you know, the, you'd have to, I guess you'd have to pick and choose between one or the other. Um, but it, it would be, what am I trying to say? There would be less full-time opportunities, I guess I'll say, because maybe some teams, you know, either just wouldn't have the budget because they're not backed by a big company uh, or, you know, they wouldn't want to hire on someone uh, full-time, I guess. Kind of, you, you kind of see what I'm getting at. Yeah. It's like in Winnipeg, you work for the Bombers or you work for the Jets. Like True North doesn't own the Bombers. So you can't really do both unless you're freelancing, but then you're kind of running around like a chicken with your head cut off. If you are trying to coordinate the full-time work, not saying that it's a bad thing, because obviously the more opportunity, the better, but in those bigger markets where you do have Calgary sports entertainment, you do have Canucks uh, sports entertainment as well in Vancouver. Um, you as well have, like you mentioned, MLSC, OSEG in Ottawa. So there's more opportunity in those bigger cities. Obviously the logistics of getting there and figuring that out is like just having the good content in the first place, but it is a bit tougher in Canada. There, there should be a family feud question about this. You know, we surveyed a hundred people. What is the, the thing that is the most difficult about getting full-time work as a creative? Uh, I'm going to say budget, Steve, show me budget. <laughs> ding and it's gonna be 100 out of 100 there's gonna be no other answers because that's all what it circles back to it seems like I yeah don't... well you know whether it's you know sports because the uh, you know our track team doesn't get quite the same funding as football so you know whether it you know it's sports whether it's media again a lot of it just comes back down to uh to to budgets again like the right now the athletics department at the ufc it's you know for the most part it, it's lance and ben doing a lot of stuff um, right now, Lance is pretty much handling a lot, handling a lot of the communication stuff and I'm chipping in here and there. Uh, but again, cause I'm not a full-time employee. They have to do some managing with hours for me. Otherwise, you know, it can start screwing up with the budget. They want to money, to, money to do other things. Uh, or they, at some point they might just be like, Hey Brent, yeah, we, uh, we don't have anything left for you this year. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, you know, I like getting paid. It's always good. <laughs> Keeps my car on the road as much as I hate it. 
And as much as gas prices are jumping to unforeseen heights, uh, it also keeps uh, fueling your vehicle. It's nuts. My buddy just imported a car from Japan and they shipped it without fuel. So he had to get a full tank of premium gas, 55 liters in, uh, in Vancouver. And it cost him a hundred and twenty dollars. Oh, hurts. Yeah. Oh, oh my so, goodness, man. I'll, I'll cool. say right now, at least I'm happy to live in Alberta. Holly <laughs> Walnut's called Terry from the Sopranos, but oh, that's man. That's crazy. That I like here in Winnipeg, people are will, willing to wage war right now. It's a buck 42. I mean, which is pretty, I think oh. pretty, pretty similar to, is it similar to Calgary? I think Calgary is like 145 or something like that. I'd say it's probably pretty similar. Just jumped like 12 cents a liter overnight. So. Yeah, I got to pay $60 are, to fill a, a Mazda three. That's unfair. Yeah. I mean, I think my car is like 40 liters. And so there you go right there. A buck 42. It's, I mean, Vancouver's always had the insane prices, but yeah, like talking about money, you know, you always want to be talking about the money. Like, you know, it's all about the Benjamins as they say, but that's an important area of being a creative that sometimes I think is a bit difficult to balance because you want to create the videos that look great, get the work, but then you're also a student, let's say if you're trying to support yourself or for people that don't live at home, or even if you do, you have other expenses you want to cover. Well, you're not just going to do everything for free, are you? And then people, yeah. when, when you look at hiring a photographer just for a basic shoot, it's like 200 an hour and people are like, are you insane? It's like, well, do you know how much all this stuff costs? I've been looking at buying as, as we've been in contact via text, talking about looking at which camera, which cameras to look at for beginners and buying. And I'm, Go to Henry's the other day and I'm looking through some of the stuff and I see a lens for like nine thousand dollars and I was like, Ugh. I was like, wow, like, like, get pretty wow crazy. I don't want to know what the hell the body of this song costs. That's insane. But they're just like, oh, whatever. Yeah, this this will be about 200 300 difference. And I'm like, and it's not like that's like super crazy. So money is an issue, or sorry, can be an issue for people who are starting in the creative space. How did you navigate that issue? And how do you continue to balance the fine points of making sure that your content is absolutely maxed out at the best it can be, but not going way over the budget of what's available to you at the moment? I mean, it's always a fine balance, uh, you know, especially now that over the, the year we had off, uh, you know, I still managed to, to get some new equipment and, and upgrade what I got. Um, yeah, you know, with, with some of the media that you see out there, you know, uh, like the Toronto Argonauts put out that really cool video for their, uh, their uh, retro game where they had those uh, free sweaters and all that. Uh, you know, I follow the guy that did a lot of the work for that. And it was a lot of work in After Effects, uh, which can be very time consuming compared to, you know, a lot of the work you do in Premiere, which is mostly, you know, cutting and maybe some effects and color grading and that sort of stuff. Um, so, I mean, it's... Uh, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a balance that's hard to get unless it's something that you're doing frequently, if that makes sense. So, you know, when I look at a lot of the work that, uh, that you see down in the States, cause again, it, it's great work because these guys are full-time employees this is what they can dedicate all their time to. Um, you know, I see like, Oh, I can do something like that. I can do something like that. That's going to take a lot of time to do that though. Um, so it's just, you know, getting a gauge on what's, you know, hot in the industry, I guess I'll say what, what's looking really cool. What's getting attention, what's getting clicks and balancing that with how much money uh, am I going to waste for the athletics department? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, there are some times where, you know, I want to create some extra coverage or pieces and I talk to Lance about, it and they say like, look, you know what it's, you know, that, that's just not within our uh, a budget to do. We don't really want to allocate hours to that, but maybe we can do more hours with this. So the prime example is with track and field. When I go out to meets, I bring my camera equipment, you know, I'm, doing a mix of photos and video for our team because, you know, I, I want to phrase this carefully because I don't just want to come on here and be like, my boss has told me that no one cares about track, uh, which is what I'm not trying to say. It's just not as big of a priority as something like basketball because we're not on campus. We can't really generate money because we can't sell tickets because we just don't have a good enough track facility at the UFC. Um, so, you know, they're less likely to want to be like, oh, this random meet you're going out to in the middle of February. Yeah, we'll pay you X amount to do this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that I will end up doing for free just to help kind of bolster the uh, the, the track track media game, I guess. Um, but they will want to cover, you know, some of the bigger events like Canada West in U uh, Sports, which thankfully they don't have to spend money on sending me to U Sports for track because I get there on my own or on the team's budget, I should say. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm there as an athlete, so... Uh, it works out in that way. So it's, it's just a fine, kind of a fine balancing act um, in, in that sense, I guess. We were talking a little bit before we started recording and you were saying that uh, you had been 
to SAIT before for a year. Um, were you also a student athlete at SAIT during that time or when, or did you just come to UFC and then you jumped in there? No, so I've been a student, I guess I've been a student athlete for the longest time. I started running track when, uh, just before I turned 13. So we're, uh, we're pushing then 12, 12 years in track now pushing on to year 13 here. Um, so I did go to States and one of the big reasons was one day of the program I liked. And then the year before I went to state, actually they, uh, ACAC launched their own track program. Uh, previously they'd only offered cross country, which is not for me. I am not a distance runner, no matter how much people think I am. Uh, it's just cause I'm tall and skinny, but uh, <laughs> middle distance runner. I'll give him that. Um, yeah. So I went there to do both. Um, and you know, that was an experience. So I went there in 50, uh, 2015 to 16 to do the radio program. And I guess, you know, if I were to look at it, if I look back at it, I would say, you know, I could identify the moment where maybe I, I you know, creative media was probably more for me. Uh, Cause what I was saying earlier is that I didn't like a lot of aspects cause I'm in the radio television broadcast news program. I just didn't like a lot of aspects of uh, being on radio and the unfortunate part about being on radio and watches the circles background of budget um, is that when you're finished radio, you typically or finish the radio program. You typically have to go to a very small market. You know, I know people that went to Peace River, Yorkton, uh, Vanderhoof, I think it was called in BC, uh, you know, some kind of almost remote areas in Northern BC. So, you know, that would have killed my track career. Um, so I decided to drop out of the program. Uh, I also didn't like the on-air aspect of it. You know, a lot of people tell me I have a voice for radio, but because the program was so FM geared, I, I just didn't feel like it was me. You know, I, I felt kind of goofy being the guy that says, you know, oh, that was uh, this track on this station. Huh, here's an anecdote. Now back to the hits. And I just wasn't me, but I did like doing the audio production stuff. And, you know, funny enough, now I'm doing video production stuff with, you know, the occasional uh, bits of audio here and there. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, you know, it kind of sucks walking away from being a collegiate athlete for a bit, but I was still, you know, still training, still racing, just not with the school. Um, and then I went back a, for um, uh, 2017 to 2019 for a different program called New Media Production and Design. And that's actually what helped me get, uh, get on with the UFC as well. Um, but as a student athlete there again, so I used three years of eligibility at uh, SAIT. And then I hopped in at the UFC and all the coaches knew who I was. Um, so I've been doing track for so long and I was having a good bit of success. Um, so I hopped in and I'm using my last two years of eligibility uh, luckily we had a well-timed global pandemic. Uh, so I had three years of school to do at the UFC. Uh, so I did, uh, you know, 2019, 2020, uh, last year was off. And then this year, my last year of school lines up with my last year of eligibility. So it's kind of worked out. It, was, it has worked out perfectly because you get to finish them in unison and then be able to jump right into doing even more creative stuff or unless there's, a uh, run at the Olympics with the track and field in mind. So then maybe that might alter the plans. A uh, little ways off of the Olympics. And I'm, uh, I'm getting up there in age a little bit to, uh, to not be running Olympic standards. So, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see where we're at in uh, in a little bit sport wise. <laughs> How did you get your social media handle? Like the, like it must be a nickname or something like, Oh, lemon that? spread. Yes. Yeah, lemon so spread. that is that a very underwhelming story. Um, so this was way back in like 2014, I was at uh, junior nationals with my coach and a couple of my teammates who were all in a, a minivan going to the track. And one of the guys, or sorry, 2013. Uh, so one of the guys in our car was talking about how he had an allergy to Splenda. And I didn't know what Splenda was at the time. And I wasn't listening to the conversation. So I tuned in and I said, what's Splenda? That sounds like a brand of lemon spread. And everyone's like, what? So everyone in the car just looks at me. My coach is looking in the mirror. I'm like, dude, we're on the freeway in Montreal right now. And everyone's like, dude, what is that? So they just started calling me lemon spread. And I just changed all my social media handles to it. It just seemed, just seemed straightforward, you know? <laughs> so it's sort of grown and it's almost become its, its own brand. Uh, you know, it started with a lot of people around the track would start calling me lemon spread, especially people from Lethbridge. So when we'd show up to like the track and see, you know, the Lethbridge pronghorns, they'd be like, Hey, lemon spread. And it, it just sort of spread from there. Um, and then when I started getting involved with the UFC, you know, again, just because it's, it's a, I guess, an odd name or attention capturing name, I'll say, uh, you know, a lot of people started seeing, like, oh, who's Lemon Spread? And then it gets associated with me and it just, it's just sort of built, built and grown itself. So do you have any t-shirts or any clothing that have lemons or that are like lemon yellow or anything that, that really stick out? 
I don't. I have thought of like, you know, having a hat with like a, a lemon emoji on it or something or or getting a, a black shirt on the sidelines that says like at lemon spread on the back. <laughs> don't know if we'll, we'll do that quite yet. We'll see. Lemon spread merch may be coming soon. I think the hat would actually be really cool because then you just kind of get to to just rep the brands, to be honest. Like I would I would always wear uh, this this sweater that is lime green and it has a little logo on the on, on the chest that ha- says sumo on it which is a portuguese soft drink <laughs> but it's red writing with a white circle and then it's lime green so my friend first saw it and 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 he pointed it out because him and i have those kind of like odd specific observations like you said splenda is that lemon spread he was like, it looks like gain laundry detergents. That's, that's what it looks like. So then guess what happened? Every person after that who saw it, they're like, wow, that looks, is that gain laundry, deter- laundry detergents? His mom said it. So many people said it. And then eventually, whenever I wear it, people always just associate that with a you know, laundry detergent or you know, is that gain? And uh, so I love wearing the sweater now. It's, I, I got a value village for like four bucks because I saw it. I was like, oh, like my family, half my family's Portuguese. We go to Portugal and drink sumo. Like, <laughs> There's no way there's a sweater of this. Like you couldn't buy, there's nowhere to buy it online in a store. Like you had to have been, you know, working there in Portugal to have gotten the sweater or be one of their like creative uh, social media figures or something that they have. Cause that's how they try to boost the brand now through like Instagram and stuff. And so there you go. It's just like those quirky things I think are so funny. So yeah, if you got like a hat or a shirt or whatever with a little lemon on it, I mean, you're already, people always putting the lemon drops on their social media stories when they're, sharing your content. I think that would be honestly a super funny idea. And honestly, it just not even funny, but like, just embrace it. Like you, you already changed your handle. So like, it really just goes with, uh, with the homage that you're, you're giving to the amazing fruit that is a lemon. Could you not get the, the Twitter handle at gain laundry detergent? Is that taken? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually think about that one. I just, um, it's, it's a local joke right now, but I guess if I'm not wearing it, if I'm shooting video or some, some something somewhere out in, per, in public, then maybe people will be like, man, who's that gain launch detergent <laughs> ambassador? I mean, I have uh, sh- took my shot at, uh, oh, Sumo and Gain need to do a collab here, you know, like uh, the official launch detergent of Sumo and the official drink of gain launch detergent. But um, I'm definitely in the creative works, actually, on a little project I'm g- trying to get going here on uh, on utilizing the, the gain launch detergent uh, Sumo looking uh, collab. So we'll, we'll have to see where that uh, goes in the next little bit. But yeah, it's... I, I like the quirkiness of those kinds of things. Yeah, I think I, sh- I, you know, I need to do a bit better of a job at branding myself. One of the reasons I haven't right now is just because I'm a student athlete and I'm working for the athletics department. You know, I, I just don't want to brand myself, throw myself out there and start getting too many job offers. You know, right now, uh, just those two clips that I posted on Instagram, one was of Jalen Philpot, one was of our, our new running back. I don't know. I haven't talked to him, so I don't know if it's Javier Williams or if it's Javier Williams. I have no, I don't, it's one or the other. It's J A V I E R. Anyways, there's a clip of him running and there's Jalen and those were shared around enough. And I actually got, you know, a couple offers to do some work here and there for, uh, um, one is out Al- the alpha project that's with, um, uh, Taylor Altilio, special teams coach with the Stampeders. Yeah. And actually the Stampeders, uh, game film guy reached out to me and, uh, talked to me about maybe doing some game film stuff. So I got my foot in the door, got a, got a few things going. Um, I got a music video offer too. Someone wanted me to help them film music videos, uh, which funny enough, I've, I've shot one before and it was with uh, Treshawn Abrahams Webster and now a Ottawa Red Black. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, some of the stuff I do have to start turning down even right now because I, you know, I just don't have the time. Um, you know, I, I have done a bit of freelance work here and there. I did a little bit uh, in the pandemic with uh, Raw Sports uh, that's owned by Robbie... Uh, Robbie Woodson and Anthony Woodson. Uh, Robbie plays for the Toronto Argonauts. Anthony Woodson uh, has played around a bit and uh, finished his career at Stan Peters. Uh, one of the other clients I was working with was Illy Buka, currently a Saskatchewan Rough Rider, bounced around the NFL a couple of times here and there. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think once I graduate, I think branding myself a little bit more would definitely be a good move. Uh, I also got to come up with a watermark because I started seeing my video show up in a couple of places with uh, zero consultation. And I just feel like a it's mine. Don't ask me. I sometimes I've had to text text Lance and be like, "Did you give my footage to these people?" And he's like, "No," almost every time. <laughs> so ah, uh, you know what happens if you know if your stuff's getting ripped off like that? You're doing something right, I guess. 
yeah, I mean, then it's better that that's happening than no one noticing it, I guess. Like, not that it's good in the first place, but like, <laughs> well, at least someone likes it, but you know, you're, you're going to get there. I mean, you got the lemons and on your side, you know, I, I think there's so many, honestly, just creative things to do with, the, with, with just the, the emoji, the image. Every time that I see the lemon emoji or like someone have the word, le- like I actually knew a guy that had lemon in his name, like dead serious. <laughs> you ever watched SpongeBob as a kid? Yes. So I remember one of the episodes of with Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy, I think it was the last one they ever made where Barnacle Boy goes over to the bad side. And what happens is, um, is they create an alliance like all the bad guys and they call it evil and evil stands for every villain is lemons otherwise known for evil so every time that i see the lemon emoji or someone say oh my name is blah 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 lemon or whatever they they like the the fruit i always think of that clip from spongebob so the first time that i saw your page on instagram i was like every villain is lemons (laughs) Funny enough, so day uh, head coach of the Stamps, Dave Dickinson, now knows that I go by Lemon Spread. Uh, he learned that because there was like a, a Q and A thing that the Stamps did, and uh, I just submitted a question asking about you know Andre Salgado, and Alana Nolan read it off and said Lemon Spread asks blah 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 blah, and he's like, "Is that Sean Lemon?" And she's like, "No, that is actually uh, Brent Steven. And I'm like, "He's like, oh, okay, made the connection there." So it's kind of funny to see where, where the branding has ended up. Cause uh, when I used to be able to go into Stan Peters practices, which I can't anymore because of COVID um, there's one time where uh, I was kind of down in the media area, kind of with my dad and Josh Bell comes running by and he's going to high five me. He's like, what's up lemon spread. I'm like, Oh, my hero here is calling me lemon spread. <laughs> so yeah, always a good time with the name lemon spread. So Brent, we're getting towards the end of our time in today's episode. So I want to ask some some rapid fire questions and have a little more fun before we part for today. Let's go for it. Who's your favorite player from the Stampeders that you've seen in your lifetime? Current or all time? Oh, I guess lifetime. Uh, I would say it is probably is Kenyon Rambo without a doubt. Uh, my dad would have a spare audio recorder. So at practice, I would go and interview Kenyon Rambo and he would give me like actual answers. Like I'm actually a reporter and he's just an absolute personality. So you know, I haven't seen him for a long time at this point, but uh, Kenyon Rambo. What is the favorite, your, your favorite Stamps game that you remember seeing that was not the Great Cup? Because people always just put Great Cup. Out. Not the Great Cup. Oh, uh, the comeback against Toronto in 2014, the biggest one in history. That was pretty wild. Um, oh, there's a lot. Ooh, I would say. Oh. You know, this one would have taken a lot of thinking. I'm just going to throw it there. I'll say uh, Hamilton game where we beat them 60 to one in uh, 2017. That's when they started out 0 and 9, the uh, the Tiger Cats. So I'll say that game. That was pretty nutty. I think that was when Buckley ran for like a 50 yard touchdown on a QB sneak, right? Like he just like ran right end and then, oh, just accidentally took it to the house. I'm pretty sure that was the same game. Yeah. Yeah. Threw a dino to dino touchdown to Anthony Parker. <laughs> Favorite game that you've had the opportunity to do videography for besides the Vanier Cup? Side. I would say it was probably the home opener this year because uh, I got to bring out all my new fancy camera gear. I got a lot of great shots. The fill pots just went nuts. So I could make an entire highlight tape off of that. Uh, and I had another camera running around with a gimbal uh, and I got some great shots of them, you know, screaming, doing their We Are UC chant. So I'd say a home opener for football at least. If you were to give three pieces of advice to someone who's looking to get into the creative space with video or photo, what would it be? Uh, buy a 70 to 200, uh, a lens, uh, you know, makes, if, it, if you can get an F 2.8, 70 to 200 lens, do that. Uh, if the F four is in your price range, definitely do that. Um, <laughs> Get good if you're doing video, especially or mostly if you're doing video, get good at manual focus. If you do that, you can get a lot of great shots. Otherwise, you might accidentally ruin a lot of great shots. Uh, and the other one is I would say don't stop learning at any point and study other content. You know, don't copy people's content, but you know, look at what's look at other people's content, especially in the States, see what a lot of the trends are. 
uh, apply that to your work. And uh, I'd say that that's a good one. Make sure, yeah, make sure you can stay on top of industry's trends. Make sure you keep improving. Biggest lesson that you learned from your first year of being a content creator full time? Uh, stop abusing slow motion. <laughs> I relied on that a little bit too much, and uh, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, time on. Time has gone on, and I've studied a lot of content. Uh, you know, a lot of creators use it a little more sparingly. And looking at my old work, I definitely overuse that. So, uh, you know, get more comfortable. And don't try to jam hip hop beats into everything because we use a, a big licensed music library and I always try to just jam it hip hop in there and don't always do that. You know, find something exciting, know your audience. And, you know, like for the, the Dino's intro video for football, I ended up using, uh, a, 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 I guess, rock or metal, I guess. Um, so be flexible with what you're using and don't use too much slow motion. <laughs> If there was one dream event that you could shoot videography for, what would it be and why? Uh, I would have to say a great cup as long as the Stampeders are in it and we win. Uh, <laughs> you know, if I had the same skills I do now and I could go back and work 2018, I think that would have been an absolute dream. Like, I, oh, capturing Terry Williams touchdown would have been incredible. <laughs> uh, you, you, went, you went to the Super Bowl if you had the chance? You know, I've never been all that into the NFL. Uh, you know, my parents will invite people over to watch it. Uh, not in recent times, but we used to. They invite over, oh, by invite over some family friends. Um, but you know what? I just have a, a different connection to the CFL and the NFL. You know, my dad's been, you know, he's in the Hall of Fame. He's been doing games since 1996. I think the whole time he's missed three. You know, I've been going to practice as long as I can remember. These guys have been my idols for the longest time. Um, so I, I, you know, huge bias towards the CFL just because of my relationship with it. Who do you think are the top three of the top greatest stampeders of all time? Like even outside of your lifetime? Oh, any position? going before my lifetime is hard. Um, but I've been archiving my dad's old cassette tapes and listening to a lot of them. So greatest three all time. I would say you got to put Alan Pitts in there for sure. Um, and blanking on some of the earlier 90s names because that's, you know, I was four. Uh, Doug Flutie. So it's, yeah, uh, Doug Flutie, I'd say you have to put in there. Um, oh, I want to throw in Kamar Jordan, but that's definitely a bit of bias there. I mean, if, if we're going to go numbers wise, I'm going to say you have to throw in Bo. Okay, I'm going to even this out. We're going to put in one quarterback. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Bo. Um, as long as he stays healthy for the next few years. Uh, Bo... Alan Pitts and Kelvin Anderson. That's, so, that's pretty good. Yeah. Like you could honestly make like a top five of quarterbacks for the stamps and it would be better than almost any other teams. Like you could, oh, yeah, hundred percent. Flutie, Garcia, Bo, um, even, even like Henry Burris, like he's still amazing. And then um, I'm just trying to, th I mean, Marcus Crandall wasn't like super, like hall of fame-ish but i mean he obviously won a great cup with them so that's good enough i guess but yeah like alan pitts as well being on the team and his record being broken twice now since uh 2008 is uh i mean it's been broken but only twice in the last whatever like 13 years so that's that's pretty hard to do he was pretty incredible and you know the stamps obviously have been better in the time that your dad has been working with them than before that so i think that's a great time to be a part of the organization um, but yeah, like really hard to nail down just three from different positions. Cause like there's so many amazing quarterbacks, even just for, for Calgary, honestly. Yeah. From, you know, the mid nineties to now we've, we've just had incredible luck. I mean, like they say, preparation meets opportunity, opportunity, right? So the stamps have won, I think more great cups since the nineties than any other team. Maybe the Argos are tied. So they, they they've done a pretty good job. I know that I remember when speaking with JT Hay when he was coaching with Calgary on the team in 2016, and he was saying, "Yeah, like when Wally Buono showed up, that's when things turned around." Because before that, it wasn't really that great. And then they won 92, 98, 01, 08, 14, 18. So like it's just it's crazy that they've won that many in such a short amount of time. Whereas sit in that whole time, Calgary's won five. Winnipeg has won one so far. So like <laughs> so far. I mean, yeah. next time as, as time as as time goes on, like obviously they could win more. Like you know, if they win this year, the pandemic will get worse. 
because they've won in a few months later. You know, the world turns upside down. We can't let them do it again. Well, I mean, you never know what's going to happen, right? I mean, it's um, no one expected them to. I honestly thought they were going to miss the playoffs last year and then they ended up winning. So, like, that's I can't complain because I never seen Winnipeg win the Great Cup. I've seen they've been in it five times since they last won and they lost them all and then they eventually won. So, it kind of evens out, I guess. Like, Winnipeg have had their spells, Calgary have had probably one of the longer spells in terms of like eras in franchise history, but Saskatchewan obviously are like Kings of that. And then Hamilton are now taking the throne over not having won since 99, not even the century. Like that's, oof. but maybe Hamilton's due for one of the next few years and Calgary can take a little bit of a vacation, I guess, from all the success for a few years and then let Bo rest up and then get back to the top where, uh, where Calgary has been for the last 20 years. I prefer if we can keep going, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. I miss the days when I would see that we're playing Winnipeg and just sort of check, check the box. Like, all right, that's a win. I I did the opposite. I was like, Oh, we're playing Calgary today. So I know they're not going to win today. I mean, I remember this year has been the case in 2014. I remember the last game of the season, all the backups played. It was like a preseason game. It felt like, but Winnipeg won. And it was the first time that they'd won at McMahon since 2001. And I was like, Oh, well, I guess they, Broke a streak, but it didn't mean anything. So it wasn't oh, until that the West. Part- you said that was, that was 2017, right? 2014. 2014. Okay. Drew I... Willie was the starter. Oh, okay. I don't think I was at they, that game. They played Brian Brom. And then I, I think Drew Tate was the backup for Calgary. I can't remember. I mean, Calgary went, went out to the win the great cup. Yeah. So like they, they benched every, all the starters and stuff. And it was a snowy game. So it was like 17 to nine or something really awkward. And, but Winnipeg won. And so it technically counted. But I mean, asterisk. Yeah, asterisk on that. And then they beat um, Calgary and Calgary in 2017 before the West semifinal. They lost, which they lost. So it didn't even matter. Like they beat Calgary, but Buckley was starting. And then I think um, Dan I remember that Lefebvre, game. Dan Lefevre started for Winnipeg. So again, another meaningless game. And then when they won the West semifinal against Calgary, I was like, okay, that's the first meaningful win in McMahon since 2001. They've already done that's, it twice since that time, but I don't count those ones because they didn't mean anything. And they were, yeah, they, I was, no. I was shocked when we lost that one, but then afterwards I found out that Bo didn't record a single passing stat in the third quarter. And that's when I was like, Oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> that's it's kind of hard to win football games. If you're oof, that's, I mean, Hey, yeah. like every dog has their day. And I mean, he still has like one of the most spotless CFL careers for a quarterback, like in this century and almost ever. So, I mean, Oh, yeah. eventually people have to have their downs if they have a bunch of ups but he's i'm still scared of calgary i would not let my foot off the pedal for any cfl team honestly i think they'd be the scariest team to cross over to be honest with you if they do i think they could be the first team to make the great cup as a crossover than anybody still it's difficult because obviously edmonton we thought the same thing of them in 2019 and they still couldn't do it but you never know like if Bo gets hot or calgary sprinkles some you know magic dust and they can always do it they're they're good enough so yeah i will see where it goes <laughs> and final question i have for you today is who is your favorite creator that you mo- maybe not model your work after but are inspired by and enjoy following their content oh that's that's a good one um oh, i can't say i have an absolute favorite i just sort of follow a couple of guys and get some uh, get some good info from all of them um, you know, I'll say for at least Canada, uh, I like some of Peter, uh, Peter Sorelius's work. He, he kind of took a similar path to me. Uh, I don't know his education background, but, uh, I know he, I don't know if he went to two different schools like I have. Uh, but anyways, he did work with Ryerson and I think he graduated from there or whatever they call Ryerson now. Um, so he does some work with the CEBL, which is really great. Uh, he does work with MLSE now as well, too. So he'll do a bit of stuff for the Argos. So, uh, you know, let's just say him because uh, that is, you know, he's Canadian and so am I. <laughs> and that's if that's, you know, it's it's good enough for you. It's good enough for me. And I mean, it's always great to be able to follow the work of local creators in terms of national, I guess. It's not even enough from Calgary. But yeah, that's. I definitely have to go check out his work because I always love being able to know the stories of the people behind the camera because they're the ones that are good at telling the stories, <laughs> but it's also interesting to learn about the people who are the ones telling the stories that maybe we don't always see. So with that, Brent, I want to thank you for having me on today's episode, man. It was great to talk to you again. As always love the content, keep pushing out the lemon spread. You definitely want to see more of the, the lemon emojis all over the TL. Cause that's, when you know, the fire content's coming in. <laughs> want to keep up with the tech talk. 
when those numbers run up, then there's nothing quite like it. The dopamine that you get from seeing notifications at over 50 when you open up the TikTok app, I think is should now be classified as more addicting than heroin. So we're going to have to <laughs> get a, a, a CDC check on that, I think. But man, it was great to have you on, bro. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, you know, I'm going to plug myself a bit. I think we've mentioned it enough. People can probably find me on social media. Um, you know, a other project that I'm working on right now is, uh, the university of Calgary Dinos TikTok. We are only the second, uh, it's only the second athletics department sanctioned account in Canada. Uh, other teams have started their own and I don't think the athletics departments know about them because our field hockey team also did that. Uh, anyways, only quote unquote official one that's currently active. I'll say, uh, the very first one in Canada West, but that's going pretty good. Uh, you know, we're pushing to, uh, just about 2,400 followers. So let's keep running up real good one coming out on, uh, on Monday to watch. Make sure you guys get at Brent at lemon spread, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you can find the handle as well. It's at, is it at uh, you Calgary dinos or what's the official handle for TikTok? Yep. At you Calgary dinos trying to get verified. <laughs> Make sure check out you Calgary uh, at you Calgary dinos on TikTok. You're going to be seeing some stuff all over Instagram, the, the reshares as well. Make sure to go check them out in the app. Check out Brent's work on Instagram and Twitter. And thank you, everyone, for listening to today's episode with University of Calgary Dinos track star, as well as content creator Brent Stevens.